If you're an entrepreneur and you're just trying to break into something, I genuinely believe the two he greatest hacks are building events shit. and building a brand on Twitter. Do you think someone should start right away when they're young or do you think they should go and work in the field? Jason Yanowitz, the co-founder and CEO of Blockworks. The $135 million crypto media empire. He is also the host at the Empire Podcast. One of the go-to podcasts in the space for crypto founders and investors. What got you so fascinated by the world of cryptocurrency? There was this one event that I went to. They gave the most eloquent talk that I had ever heard about Ethereum. I come back, my buddies are chilling on the couch, and I say, I'm launching an Ethereum consulting firm. Who wants it? Nobody wanted in, really. <laughs> How did raising $12 million change the way you operate the company? It's a promise to someone else to get them a return on their capital. You can raise a lot of money for a software business and have more success than someone who raises less money. With media, it's just a trust game. And what those companies fail to understand is that you can't spend money to mm. buy trust. Mm. So you just shared with me something you've been afraid to share publicly until now. It's called cluster headaches, right? Yeah, so they're known as suicide headaches, the rate of suicide in people with cluster attacks is between 9 to 11 times than the average population. It's not that people want to kill themselves or that they don't like their life, it's that they want to get rid of the pain in the moment. Jason, you told me you were reading three books about history at any point in time. Yeah. yeah. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? I think we are going to go into 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel. Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter, the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer 2 with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. And Astar Network, a scalable network connecting people to Web3 through entertainment, blockchain development, and community events. The problem is, the problem is getting good quality people in a studio. Yeah. So, so, that's why I'm in the US, yeah, right? Like I'm in the US. Like Lex that. does that, Joe, Joe Rogan does that. Exactly. Like, I think it's just like, as you build a bigger brand, people start coming come. to you. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's, for the moment, that's not the case. So that's it why I'm in the US. Happen, yeah. That's why I'm in the US. Yeah, our biggest, one of the biggest mistakes we ever made was not betting on ourselves earlier that we would be able to build something big. So by the way, are we, are we live? Are yeah. we good? Yeah, like we're- Oh. Keep in mind about we, we usually start very oh, organically closer. like that. Oh, cool. So, my bad, my bad. Continue. Cool. Biggest uh, mistake is not betting on yourself earlier that you could build something big. It, um, when we, so Mike and I were both 23 or 24 when we started Blockworks. Mm. So we had never, we had never done any, we, you know, we weren't second time founders. We had never raised, we, 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 mm. we didn't go out and raise a big, you know, series A or seed round or anything like that. And so when we, there were all these decisions that we made early on that were partly driven by lack of understanding of how big we could actually make this. And also the fact that we didn't have any money, mm -hmm. uh, both personally and in the company means we had to do things that only generated revenue. So we would do things, we would do these ridiculous things in, in hindsight, which was like our podcast network, we would go to other people, Pomp, Meltem, Jill, Ryan Selkis, Charlie Shrem, Scott Melker, and we would build their shows for them instead of building our own in-house shows, which was, we thought it was great because we were making all this money, but there was no actual IP and like, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't building a business. We were building like an agency essentially, or I remember, you know, Multicoin. Yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah. Multicoin hired us to run their Multicoin summit in 2019. Mm. I think they paid us 15K or 20K. We were over the moon because that was, you know, money was so tight. I can't even explain how tight money was, um, but it wasn't building a business. It was building cash flow that wasn't scalable. So I like, as I, I don't know, as I look back, I'm like, yes, we had to do that because we had to make money and we had to pay the bills. But man, I wish we started like, we didn't really focus on building our own in-house content until 2021. And we launched December, 2017. So that's 2018, 2019, 2020, where we, we weren't actually building our own stuff. We we're just trying to make money. Before we dive deeper into any of yeah. that, you say, we, 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 who are you? 
Um, Blockworks was started by, uh, actually, we don't usually share this, but two, three, three people, um, uh, two of my best friends, um, Mike and, uh, this other person. So my, so my name, yeah, my name's Jason. I'm from San Francisco, like went to school in Atlanta, all that stuff and living in New York. When we moved, when I moved to New York, I lived in a, uh, apartment with four other guys. And, um, I was very into crypto and very into actually really just into Bitcoin at that point. I, there was this moment in time, which we can talk about if interesting, where I kind of had this aha moment and wanted to launch a actually consulting firm for companies to learn how to build on Ethereum, uh, big enterprises. And so my only, I had two friends who were crazy enough to say yes. Um, one of the friends ended up going to join Galaxy Digital after a couple of months. So then that just left uh, Mike and I. And, and Mike Mike was yeah one of my best friends. I'd lived with him in New York. I went to college with him. So we'd been friends for several years before BlockWorks. Um, and he was yeah crazy enough to do this with me. And who are you, Jason? I get really into the deep questions right out of the gate. <laughs> I am, um, I mean, I, I, I am the way, like in, in one word, the way I think about myself is just someone who likes to build things in an entrepreneur. Um, both my parents were entrepreneurs and college dropouts. Um, I grew up like kind of with a dislike of the system and with rules. Um, been kind of hustling to make money ever since I can remember. Like whether that's, you know, I remember when I was in third grade buying eBay, I'd buy baseball cards on eBay that had bad marketing and bad graphics and bad copy. I'd bring them home and I'd resell them on eBay, the same card with better marketing, or I did this whole like multi-level marketing thing in, in college, which ended up being a, looking back, not a good thing to do, but at the time I didn't know. So I've always just been kind of hustling to make money outside of the traditional system. Um, that's, I think that's the way that I, I'm, that's the way that I think about myself is just someone who likes to build things outside of the normal rules. You said your, both your parents dropped out of college, right? Yeah, my mom went to like six or seven different colleges and my dad dropped out and they both started their own businesses and both sold their own businesses. Yeah. You said also you almost dropped out of college because you were doing this multi-level marketing tried. scheme, right? I tried. <laughs> yeah. So the story is, so when I was 18, I, so I went to Emory in, in uh, Emory University in Atlanta. I'm from San Francisco. I wanted the summer in between college, I wanted some money. So I went to my mom. I was like, mom. Can I, can I get some money? Can I have some money for going out with friends and, and, and that kind of stuff? And she said, absolutely not. Why would I, I'm not just going to give you money. So, um, I had one friend, uh, who was working at the Taco Bell at the time. She said, go work at Taco Bell with Jake. I said, I'm not working at, I'm not, I'm not, I'm sorry. I like have my pride is too high. I'm not working at the Taco Bell. So at, around that time, uh, another friend who's a year older, just come back from, from university. And he said, look, I'm doing this thing. It's this energy drink thing where instead of spending 40% of the company's money on uh, marketing and distribution and things like that, they give 40% of the, hey, you can see where this goes, right? <laughs> and I, you know, I'm 18, like I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make some money for, for college. And uh, I said, wow, what a genius, what a genius idea by this company. And yeah, they're the official sponsor of the Phoenix Suns and Dr. <laughs> Oz endorses them. And I was like, I'm, I mean, I'm in, I'm a very impressionable 18 year old. And um, so 14, 40% goes to like, like what are the exact numbers? Every time you... So what ended up happening is <laughs> every time, and you know, the way, like I'll explain it and you'll, you, you will quickly realize as everyone around me did what this is, but I was so, I was like a fish in water. Like I couldn't realize what this was. And so what ended up happening is I get to college. So I start doing this thing. The way it works is you're trying to get other people to buy these packs of energy drinks from you, right? The, the people were the distributors, you know. Yeah. Amway, Cutco, <laughs> Herbalife, it's all the same thing. So I get to college. I don't want to make a bad impression on the college kids. I'm trying to make friends at college and stuff like that and be cool and all that kind of normal 19-year-old, 18-year-old stuff. So I start learning digital marketing. I was like, I got to sell these things online instead of in person. So I go down the rabbit hole, you know, Noah Kagan and funnels and click funnels and landing pages. And within 18 to 24 months, I had... The way it worked is you would, you would, buy, someone would buy something from you and then someone would buy something from them and someone would buy something from them. And uh, within 18 <laughs> months, I had 4,600 people in my downline. I had 1,000 people in France, 700 people in Mexico, 500 people in Guam, about 1,500 people in Maryland. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the company gave me a company BMW and I was traveling around. I was 19 and I was just, telling people why, like, you know, these college kids should stop drinking Red Bull and 
they should start drinking this, you know, quotes around this healthy energy drink. And so, yeah. How is that different from what we're doing today? Getting other people to buy our shit coins. The, it's interesting. I think about that a lot. The thing, there's actually a regulatory definition of a multi-level, of a pyramid scheme versus, there are, there are actually legitimate companies that are set up in that way. And then there are pyramid schemes, right? Mm -hmm. So a pyramid scheme is defined by something where people aren't actually buying the product for the product. They're buying into the system. They're buying into the system to then sell the system to someone else and to then make money through that system instead of for the product. So, so buy, buying a shit coin to make money would fit the first category, right? Because you're buying for the product, which is I'm buying this coin to make money, not to sell it to some, Well, because most a, people don't think about selling at some point, right? Maybe, maybe the smart traders are actually, actually the pyramid scheme guys, right? Yeah. I don't think it's a one-to-one -one <laughs> with pyramid schemes, but I do think about this when you see the like a non traders who have, you know, a hundred thousand followers yeah. and you can see on chain that they're buying these things up, you know, but they don't fully disclose that. And then they share it on Twitter. It's, um, there's a lot of amazing things that, that happened in the industry that is, are not pyramid schemes and all that kind of good stuff, obviously. But some of the stuff that I think happens at the, in late stage crypto cycles ends up looking tough to sell to, to explain to outsiders, I would say. What's your biggest learning from participating so, so early into a pyramid scheme without really knowing it? I think one lesson is that you can just get really caught up in, you know, I had friends and my parents and, and folks say, you know, this is a pyramid scheme. I, I could not I would, I would not comprehend that. I could not acknowledge that. And, um, it was, there was two moments in time. It was, uh, Bill Ackman and Carl Icahn, these two hedge fund activist investor legends took on Herbalife. So Carl Icahn was defending Herbalife. Bill Ackman was, uh, going after Herbalife. There was this presentation in 2014, uh, which was my junior year of college. I think it was. And I watched this presentation and Bill Ackman's tearing into Herbalife and he calls on his, They say any question, you know, he opens it up to the audience for questions. And his first question, he calls on his dad in the audience to serve up this softball. And that just made me realize, like, I mean, and, and then I had another friend in college who basically sat me down and said, it's time to get serious. And so I think there's all these downsides of being in a pyramid, like the pyramid scheme and all that kind of stuff. But the thing I wondered to myself is like, would I let my kid participate in this? If my, if my, if I had an 18 year old and he or she came to me and said, Hey, look, I've got involved in this thing. Can I participate in it? And it's actually a slightly difficult question in my mind, which I know seems crazy to everyone, but what it taught me, I learned more in those years than I did in all of the years in the workforce. Pre I've learned a lot of block works, but I learned way more in those years. I learned about selling. I learned about like being able to control your own destiny. As I got very into personal development stuff, the Dale Carnegie, like, you know, Napoleon, Hill, like oh, whatever that guy's name is, like I got very into all of that kind of stuff. And it, there was a big focus on mindset and a big focus on like, look, the, you can build your business the way that you want to build your business. You don't have to go work a nine to five. And so I think it was that, that experience programmed me to, from there, I knew I was never going to work a nine to five in my life. But you still did it. I did it because I didn't know how else to, I didn't, that was the way I knew how to not do it. And all of my friends were getting jobs in finance in New York. Mm. And I just said, I don't know what else to do. Let me follow them. But I mean, I only lasted, I lasted my first job for 11 months and my second, or maybe 10 months and my second job for 11 months. And then, and then we founded Blockworks. So I wasn't too long for that world. What made you stop your finance career? Career is a very kind way to put it. I, uh, <laughs> I worked at a venture firm for, I think, 10 months. Um, the... As a, as a very kind way to put it, um, I didn't like it. I don't, I don't, I don't love finance, honestly. I don't, I, the, the, the thing I like is, is building a business and building something. Um, and I don't like these are kind of archaic bureaucratic systems. And, uh, it was a very small firm, but they couldn't, they, they, they really couldn't get on board with crypto. We looked at some, like, I remember getting laughed out of the room, bringing them, I think it was a Twitter thread or Reddit post or something, I getting laughed out of the room. And we looked at some of the early like venture deals and like the Coinbase's and BitGo's of the world. And uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I remember getting laughed out of the room multiple times, basically. And the thing that, that was, that was actually the original kind of idea for Blockworks was, hey, look, there's these like gray haired 50, 60, 70 year old folks. Eventually, 
crypto is this retail asset class right now. Eventually, it's going to become this big institutional asset class. Those folks are going to need a thing that feels more like the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg and less like Twitter. Uh, and so that was like the early idea for BlockWorks, but we didn't end up taking action on that for another year or two. Why? I think that it's really easy for people on Twitter. We're so engr engrossed in this startup world today. Mm. Like we, you know, just on crypto Twitter and everyone's building businesses and all your friends are building businesses and you have businesses outside of this podcast. 99% of the population didn't doesn't understand what, what it means to build a business. They don't understand the first steps to take. They don't understand that you can go raise venture money. They don't understand, you know, I've had people from college reach out and be like, hey, can I, I'm going to pitch investors and they send me the deck and I'm like, there's there's just no way this is going to work. Like they, there, there's a whole, there's actually a very like insider system of how the whole game works, I would say. And if you're outside of the game, it's very tough to break inside of the game. And so we needed to, either understand the game, which, which we didn't to, to, to launch it, I think, or we needed conviction on something that we felt so strongly about that it didn't matter if we understood the game, but we were just going to do it anyways. And that was where we eventually got to at the end of 2017 was this conviction. But again, mm. it took us years to understand how the game was played, I would say. Which is normal. Yeah. It's just normal when you start, especially when you're young, right? Which... And we were very young. We had... I was either, Mike and I were either 23 or 24. We had, we each had about $5,000 in our bank account. Mm -hmm. We both bought into BlockWorks because we wanted to put some money into the, into the company. We each put 4,000 or $3,500 in and we were each left with, I think a thousand dollars in our bank account. It's, like, you know, it, it was like it's, 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 it's kind of incomprehensible to look back and say how little money and how young we were. It's kind of funny because it, it, it reminds me of my first company, the data analytics one, where we put each. I think 1.5K yeah. pounds because we started in London and we were all 22 and 23 years old. It feels like a ton of money. And you're like, oh man, I'm risking this capital, blah, blah, blah. Should we go equal? No, blah, blah. <laughs> and we were, I, you know, I was buying crypto on, I was, I was about as levered as you could get, right? I was, I was buying crypto on credit cards. You remember Coinbase in 2017, let you use credit cards to buy crypto. So I was buying Bitcoin, ETH, Litecoin, and Ripple using maxed out credit cards through all of 2017. Like... <laughs> What uh, got you so fascinated by the world of cryptocurrency? Um, I would say it's an evolution. I think everyone's got their kind of journey and into the rabbit hole or whatever. And I'll, I'll try not to make it a, I'll keep the story short. My family's Hungarian. Um, you know, kind of my roots are in Hungary. Not my, not my parents, but grandparents and stuff like that. Um, are from Hungary and Poland. And when I was in college, I decided to study abroad in, in Budapest in Hungary. So this was 2015. And I met a lot of Hungarians out there who, you know, their parents had lived under Soviet Union, you know, R Russia, 1950s, 1960s, after World War II was a horrendous place to be. And that's the world their parents grew up in. And so they loved the idea of Bitcoin for the self-sovereign money. Mm -hmm. They had no interest in making money from Bitcoin. I didn't even, the way Bitcoin was explained to me, I didn't even know it was a way to make money. I just thought, you know, there's this really cool thing that's self-sovereign money and I'm ride, riding the trams in Hungary and there's still little cameras on the trams. Uh, I don't know if they're on or not, but you know, there's still like, you can see this old world of uh, communist Russia and Soviet Union and stuff like that. And uh, that was the first time I got introduced to it. I moved to New York. I worked at a venture firm in 2016, looked at some crypto stuff. And then 2017, for anyone who was in New York in 2017, you couldn't ignore crypto. There were meetups and Mm -hmm. events happening nearly every day, I would say in 2017, the, they were incredibly scammy and like very like Bitcoin's going to bring down the banks, like, to, you know, not, not scammy, but like 23 year olds and 24 year olds, like very, a lot of like optimism uh, and, and a lot of scammy events. But there was this one event that I went to, I was really looking for a way out. I was really, this is, I started working at this data analytics company. I was, work, I was looking for a way out and I went to a meetup at 2 PM on a Sunday hosted by this company called Brunchwork and Amanda Gutterman, who was this, she, she's now Amanda Cassette. She runs this agency called Serotonin, but she was Amanda Gutterman back then. She was the CMO of Consensus, Consensus with a Y, the kind of like marketing and dev arm of, of Ethereum run mm -hmm. by Joe Lubin. And she gave the most eloquent talk that I had ever heard about Ethereum. And I didn't really know what Ethereum was. I was just a big, I loved Bitcoin. I didn't really know about Ethereum. And I came back from that I got there an hour early 
to that. Oh yeah, this is so I got to that event an hour early, and there was a talk about how to build a consulting firm happening. Mm. And so I think it was by this guy Sam. I forget his name. Um, so there's consulting talk for an hour. Then I hear about Ethereum for an hour. I come back and my buddies are chilling on the couch. And I say, I'm launching a, I'm launching an Ethereum consulting firm. There's going to be all these companies. You know, Walmart's moving their supply chain onto the blockchain. Uh, I'm launching a consulting firm for Ethereum. Who wants in? Nobody wanted in, really. Uh, but Mike was working at a consulting firm at the time. And he was really into the enterprise blockchain. He was like kind of into the enterprise blockchain stuff because he was a, he was at a supply chain consulting firm. And so he said, "Okay, let's do it. I'm 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 kind of in." And uh, other friends working in banking and hated it, so he said, "I'm kind of in." We woke up the next day. Mike said, "This is a horrible idea. I hate the idea. One day we can do consulting, but not yet because nobody knows us. And we're 23 or 24. So how do you go build a brand?" And he said, "Okay, well, how do we fix that?" Ah. We go to all these events and we pay money. Let's start hosting events. So we said, we'll do some events, build a brand, build a community, and then we can sell them consulting. So that was the, that was the like, I, I know it didn't fully answer your question, but that was the like tick for Blockworks. That's so interesting because I talked to uh, Ryan from Hashed. That's how they started uh, Hashed actually, building events. I mean, kind of a community, smaller events, mm -hmm. running these, uh, these meetups. And then it kind of grew into Hashed, right? So I, I believe that if you are a new, if you're an entrepreneur, you kind of have that entrepreneurial drive, but you don't know how to break into the system and you don't know, you're not an engineer. Maybe you don't know how to go raise venture money. Hosting events is the single greatest way to build your brand and build a brand that can then turn into a business, even if you don't want to build an events business. And the reason for that is I think as people get more and more successful, they like hosting their aptitude to host events goes down and down and down mm. because it's a lot of work and it's annoying and mm. they've got their own private network and they just want to kind of mingle with their own private mm. network. So if you're a 22 to 26 year old entrepreneur, let's say, and you're just trying to break into something, I genuinely believe the two greatest hacks are building events mm. and building a brand on Twitter. Mm. So when I brain bug before is exactly what I now remember. Um, you said you started 22, 23 years old, right? Do you think I did the same, but you said it took three or four years until you started to understand what the hell you were kind of doing, right? The, the first thing, the hardest thing when you start a business is to understand what game am I playing? What's the, what am I doing here? Right. right. Cause you have an idea of what your business is, but it's actually probably not. There is, you need to understand it. Right. And then you, you that's also probably how you can split between uh, these are the different key mm -hmm. functions. I mean, maybe you need different co-founders who can f fulfill the f these functions. Do you think someone should, when they have a business idea, they should start right away when they're young? Or do you think they should go and work in the field for a couple of years to learn the industry? I used to think that they should just start it right away because that's what we did. Um, <laughs> I don't think that's actually the best strategy yeah, anymore. I, think, I, think I the same. genuinely believe <laughs> I think the same. that they should, like if you are trying to launch a crypto business, I would go work at one of the big brands Mm. Go work at a Coinbase, a Solana, an Arbitrum, an Optimism, <laughs> Igen, whatever it is for a year and just learn <laughs> how the industry works. And then when you go raise money and try to hire people, your job will be infinitely easier. Absolutely. Like, our, it was so, I mean, it sounds like you too. Like it was so hard to get this thing off the ground because who were we? We were, we were nobodies. We had no brands on our name. Like we had nothing to us. So... So you said you kind of started the, you told me the other day, we started kind of like the, the wrong way, right? With events and we made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate on that? Most media businesses start in a very normal way, which is you create a piece of a content distribution channel, which is either a podcast or a newsletter. And you start building that thing. Mm. And let's say you start building great content, you start building an audience. And then you usually wake up in 12 to 24 months and you say, all right, I got to make some money now. So you turn on the ads and you start selling some advertisements. And then you say, oh, this is hard. So I hire a salesperson. I'm kind of sick of writing. So I hire a writer. And then you say, okay, well, ads don't actually, ads are kind of a tough business. Let me try to expand. And then maybe you start hosting events and then maybe you turn on a subscription product. That's usually how 99% of media companies are built. We built the company ass backwards because we didn't, we didn't know. I, I didn't say the word Blockworks is a media company until 2021. We didn't know what we were building. We didn't know the end game. We just wanted to make money in the crypto space and kind of move 
the conversation about crypto forward in a responsible way. Mm. So we started with these events and they weren't even events. They were, they were six to 10 PM happy hours. We would rent out a spot not too far from here uh, in Chinatown, like a little loft. I think we paid maybe four or five or $6,000 for the space. And we would make $15,000 in tickets and as a 10 K profit and we were over the moon. And we, we did that for several months until we linked it, up with this guy, Pompliano. One, once a month? We did them was about once every other month. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So first one was in February of 2018. Second one was in May of 2018. Then June, then July, then October of 2018. And that around that time is when we linked up with, with Pomp, Anthony Pompliano, who probably had 100,000 followers at the time relatively big, big name. He was kind of like coming up on, onto the scene and, um, he kind of like took us under his wings and he, he basically, he had spoken at one of our events. He said, look, I want to become the Joe Rogan of business. I want to go create a podcast. Do you know how to create a podcast? We said, absolutely pump. Yeah, we can go create a podcast. We go, <laughs> go home, Google how to create a podcast. And, uh, that's the way to do it. Yeah. And we <laughs> set up our first podcast, which was at the time called off the chain. Now it's called the pump podcast. Mm -hmm. And we, we didn't really have an office at that time. So we would work out of Pomp's office seven days a week. We'd go in on Saturdays and Sundays. He would go in too. And we would just, we would just crank. We would just crank. And we would just, that was the start of the podcast business. And then the events, we hired this one woman, her name is Julie, who basically told us she'd come from the events world. She's like, what are we doing hosting these happy hours? Let's, we got to go big and host conferences. So we, I can get into that. If it, we bet the whole company and every dollar in the bank count to do that. And that turned into like the big events business. Let's talk about the, the podcast first. So you said you started the podcast network, right? But you fucked it up from the beginning because you did pods for other people, right? Yeah. You thought like the, I think it's kind of like the normal way when you, when you, especially when you're young, you start a company, you're like, I want to make cash, right? I want to build a consulting business. It's right. low risk. Give me cash. And, uh, it's, I think this word IP can be very, you can feel like when you're young, like this sounds like a big thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know how to do that thing. Right. right? So I'll just, uh, I'll just help other people do something. Right. Here's the thing that we didn't understand. All cash and revenue is not treated equally by the market. Mm. So we looked at a dollar and said, that's a dollar, but the market doesn't say a dollar is a dollar. Um, the market says that $1 of conference revenue is worth $2. $1 of podcast revenue is worth $5. $1 of analytics revenue is worth $15, mm -hmm. right? But we had no concept of that. So we just wanted cash. We said, host the multi-coin summit for $15,000. That's as good as selling a $15,000 advertisement, which is as good as selling $15,000 in tickets. It's all, it's all, it's all cash. Um, yeah. What do you mean exactly? So when, when you say a dollar is worth $5 for podcast or $15 for a data com com company, it means in, in terms of valuation. In terms of valuation. The, for the business. In terms of valuation, exactly. So I think when you sit down to build something, you, I don't think you can plan your product out longer than three months. I don't think you can plan. I think there's a lot of things that happen in sprints and you kind of end up pivoting several times along the way. But one thing that I think you should think about is, what is the end state of this type of business? Mm. So let's take um, maybe not media as an example, because we're talking a lot about media. But if you look at there are all these crypto businesses that got created in 2018, 2019, 2020, BlockFi, Nexo, Celsius, Coinbase, Kraken, uh, all of them. Some of them started as lending platforms, BitGo. Some of them started as custodians. Mm. Some of them started as brokerages. They, some of them started as, as exchanges. The end state of all of those businesses looks identical. And it's the same thing with media, right? Some people start with newsletters, some start with podcasts, some start with conferences, some start with analytics. The end state is a media and information platform. It's a media and information business. And, but we didn't, we didn't know what the success, we didn't know that at the time. So I think it is helpful to think about what is the end state. And yeah, it's, it's the, to your, to your question, it's like, what is the market value that revenue at? So when we raised money, mm -hmm. we bootstrapped for the first six years. Um, we were just profitable and the cash flow paid for everything. In May of 2023, we raised $12 million and it was at $135 million post money valuation. 
And so what our investors, the lead investor, 10T, now 1RT, did was they took our revenue. 10X. And they they didn't, no, they didn't do that. They took our revenue and they sliced it into three buckets. Mm. They said there's conference revenue, digital revenue, like podcasts and newsletters, and subscription revenue. And they said, okay, the conference revenue gets this multiple, the digital revenue gets this multiple, and the analytics revenue gets this multiple, right? So that point, Understand. What you start to see is like, hey, maybe $20 million of conference revenue is identical to $2 million of subscription revenue. Whether I think that is the right thing or not, I think the market is mispricing these assets, but that is how the market treats it right now. Hey, Winshift Happens family. Time to toast our partner, Divin. They're taking luxury wine to the blockchain with their super fun concept called Uncork to Earn. Buy your favorite wines, enjoy unique experiences, and get an airdrop each time you open a bottle with your friends. Cheers to Divin for bringing transparency, authenticity, and exclusivity to the fine wines industry. You said you had a um, 7 million revenue business that you basically kind of broke down or stopped because you were not having any IP. Yeah. How do you make this decision? Incredibly hard. It was part of a larger pivot, I would say, where we basically just said we have to, we, there have been a few moments in time where we said we have to bet the house here. So the first, and I'll get to, I'll answer your question in a second, but the first moment was when we decided to go from these happy hour events to large conferences. The cost of a, the cost of a happy hour is $5,000, mm. maybe $10,000 cost of a large conference is $250,000. Mm. So when we, in May of 2019, we hosted our first large conference called DAS, Digital Asset Summit, which we still do today. That event cost about $250,000. We had $270,000 in the bank account. So if that, or no, excuse me, we had $230,000 in the bank account and the event cost $250,000. So if that event didn't work, mm. if we fell $1 under if we, you know, if, if we didn't make any money, if we lost even $10,000, we were out of business. The mm -hmm. whole Blockworks would be over. There'd be no Blockworks today if that event didn't work. And um, there have been a couple of bet the farm moments like that. And in COVID, this was, that was a bet the farm moment. So what happened is we had revenue from conferences and we had revenue from podcasts. And those are our two revenue streams, conferences and podcasts. The conferences were like our, our DAS events, the podcasts where we hosted these podcasts for other people. We'd sell ads, we'd produce the shows, all that kind of stuff. Um, in, 20, in, in March of 2019, COVID, COVID hits. We, we were hosting a big event in May 2020. 82% of our revenue at that point in time came from conferences. So overnight, 82% of our conference gets wiped. 82% of our revenue overnight gets wiped out in, one, in, in, in like one wake-up call basically with COVID. The rest of the podcast revenue. So we, so we basically said, what are we? What are we doing? We have to start doing more digital revenue, more mm -hmm. digital stuff. And we, you know, we, we would come into the city with our masks and stuff and basically whiteboard uh, Julie, uh, who's our head of events at the time, and Mike and me. And we would just whiteboard out what the business was. And we're like, should we build a morning brew for crypto? Should we do all video and compete with CNBC? Should we pivot? We talked about pivoting to cannabis. Uh, we talked about everything and the idea that we came to was we, there's Coindesk and Cointelegraph and The Block and Decrypt, but nobody is doing news and media and newsletters and podcasts the way that we want to receive it. Nobody's doing it the way we want to receive it and no one's doing, everyone's doing kind of a six out of 10 job, not a 10 out of 10 job. So we said, look, let's bet the farm again. We got to change over some of the staff, right? Mm -hmm. We got to get new staff in and let's become a media business. So we spent nine months building a media website, like an editorial site. We were, our name was Blockworks Group at the time. We cut the group and we became Blockworks. We rebranded, we hired new people, we hired reporters and journalists. And um, we, part of that was to answer your question, part of that meant cutting off one of our arms to kind of save the body. And one of the arms was uh, was all of the out, these outsourced podcasts. So we went to all of them in one fell swoop and basically cut the podcasts. And we said, we have to start over. We have to build the shows in-house. We have to own the shows. We have to have the leverage. We have to have the IP. So I launched our first podcast called Empire. Then Mike launched On The Margin. We said, if, if, if we are asking other people to do it, we have to figure out if we can do it ourselves. Mm. And um, we launched the newsletter that quarter, we launched the website that quarter, we launched everything in Q1 of 2021. And if it didn't work, it was, yeah, 
Blockworks was going to end. Um, but thank, I mean, thankfully it's worked out. So. so the first podcast you launched was Empire. First podcast was Empire. And originally the idea was, you know, I have to give you a lot of credit with this show because the original idea was there's all these people in crypto. Um, my favorite podcast at the time was How I Built This. Mm. And uh, there's all these people in crypto and everyone focuses on their companies and no one focuses on the person. And uh, that was the original idea. The, the reason I think it did, we tried that for a year and nothing happened. And the reason I think it wasn't actually a good idea for the podcast at the time was the industry was too small. So people didn't care about the people. Like it was like talking to kind of no name people. The other, the real reason was it was all virtual. Um, 100%. And you just can't yeah. get under like very deep with someone. So we ended up pivoting that to just try to become the, the best podcast in the industry. And we launched on the margin and other things. So, yeah. Can you give us an idea of what a podcast like Empire brings in annually? Yeah, our podcast business as a whole will bring in several million dollars. So today, and Empire is one of the big shows. Mm. So the reason I'm asking that is why can a podcast be so valuable? So for one reason or another, the industry has coalesced around three mediums, Twitter, podcasts and conferences. And all of the information and the flow of information and how narratives are built and customer acquisition, it all happens through those three channels, conferences, podcasts, and Twitter. And um, we right now own the largest podcast network in the industry with 1000X and 0X Research and Expansion and On the Margin and Ford Guidance and all these Lightspeed and Empire and all these shows. Podcasts are essentially the way that I see it. Um, They're the most intimate form of advertising and, and the most intimate form of content consumption. Therefore, they're the most intimate form of advertising. So if you compare like a newsletter ad, a display ad on a website, an, a social, an ad on Instagram, it's all something that you see with your mm -hmm. eyes. But things that you hear, if you like really think about the process of listening to a podcast, most people have their AirPods in. That means the host is 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 deep in your ears for a, for a full hour right <laughs> a newsletter ad there's or maybe a social ad they're scrolling right past it a podcast you're in your ear for an hour and you base you you start to think of the podcast host if if done right as friends and as like trusted confidants and um the way that i think about it is you remember influencer marketing the last several years got really big. I think that podcasts are kind of crypto's form of influencer marketing, mm -hmm. right? Because if you buy ads, let's say you buy, we sell other things, newsletter ads, display ads, um, all these other things, all these other ad forms, you're buying it from Blockworks. There's no human behind it. Mm -hmm. But if you buy ads on Empire, Jason and Santiago yeah. are now talking about your product. Um, and I think that's a very, very, very powerful form of Uh, maybe not customer, like maybe not direct response advertising, but brand awareness advertising. How much do you think businesses value brand awareness versus customer acquisition? Not as much as they should. Not as much as they should. Why? Um, I mean, if you look at what's happening with Nike, for example. So Nike, one of the best brands in the world, they got a new C CEO a couple of years ago. And his directive was to cut all brand marketing and to only do performance marketing. Mm. And you look at their last earnings report, they're down, I think, 30% in the last couple of weeks or month or year or something like that. It is a direct result of like, of, of moving away from brand advertising into, into just performance marketing. Uh, the reason, the, to, get, to tie that into crypto, all these things are commoditized at this point. Not entirely, and I'll get a bunch of pushback for saying that, but like, you know, this L2 versus this L2 100%. versus this L1 versus this L1, it all comes back to the brand. It all, it, it is, it is only about the brand and the vibe and the community. And that all ties back to the, I think the brand directly ties back to the, to the founder most times, but you need to do whatever you can if you're a marketer in crypto to get the brand out there instead of just like, Hey, go submit this lead form on our website. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all about brand awareness and association, right? And you want to be, if there is a cool podcaster, for example, like you want to be probably associated to the cool podcaster because everything is a commodity completely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Getting back to conference, um, the conference business, right? Because now we talked about the podcast side. So we want, I want to talk about the event side and then about the data side. What are the hidden economics of a conference business? 
The hidden economics. So we we got a lot of uh, someone was coming after someone shared our sponsorship deck on Twitter the other day, and we charge a lot of money, right? There's you know packages for a million dollars or five hundred thousand dollars, and you know all these the Twitter trolls were kind of coming out after us. What the, I think people who who haven't ever hosted a conference don't understand is there are a couple dynamics at play. So one is the work that it takes to host a medium sized conference is very similar to the work that it takes to host a large conference. Mm -hmm. You're still grinding away. You still have to get speakers. It's just maybe the difference of getting 1,000 attendees instead of 7,000 attendees. But the work that it takes is very, very similar. So the economics push you into doing large conferences. Now, then the, then the question becomes, well, why doesn't everyone do these large conferences? Kind of feels like they do. ETH Denver and Token and stuff like that. But there really aren't actually that many. Uh, like very large-scale conferences. Mm -hmm. It's probably... Permissionless, Token 2049, Consensus, ETH Denver. There really aren't that many. And the reason for it is the hidden economics is that there's a boatload of upfront costs to a conference. So the only thing that could kill our business, if we miss on podcasts, we miss on podcast revenue by 50%. I have to you know, tell our board that and they might not be happy, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we miss on newsletter revenue. That's okay. We miss on webinars. We miss on anything else. That's okay. If you miss on conferences, that can put the business at risk. So because of the upfront costs, right? It's the most cost intensive part of the business um, and therefore the largest amount of risk. So what uh, conferences and media and sponsorships and ad revenue in, in crypto lags the market by six to nine months. So when the, mar the let, for example, when uh, let's say market, go market goes up like in uh, 2017, that, that market, the biggest consensus that Coindesk ever hosted was not in 2017 when the market was ripping. It was actually in May of 2018. Mm. It was the largest, con right? Yeah. The thing that becomes very tough to do is you have to plan conferences very far out in advance. So you have to book your venues. You have to kind of predict how big the event is going to be. So we just booked our venue for 2026, not 25. Mm. And we were fighting against another crypto conference for that venue in 2026. And now our events team is pushing us to figure out where we're hosting it in 2027. So then, it, and it's not just where, it's, well, are we going to have 3,000 people? Are we going to have 10,000 people? Are we going to have 20,000 people? And if you do too small, you're going to leave a lot of money on the table. So that's like, it's, there's a lot of, um, it's the least, my least favorite part of the business of like predicting what this stuff will look like because it's always very scary, but it also is a, if you can get it right, it can fund a lot of the other parts of the business. So, yeah, very, very difficult, especially in a cyclical market like crypto, right? It's extremely it's difficult. So like in 20, in 2026, should we have a huge conference, a medium conference, a small conference? Well, let's say, let's say you think the market is going to go, we're going to go into a bull market in 2025. Mm. If the bull market ends in fall of 2025, you could still host a massive conference in the first half of 2026. But if that conference is in the late later half of the latter half of 2026, you're going to get caught on the other on you're going to get caught in the depths of a bear market. So it becomes very very difficult. So what was your decision for 2026? Um <laughs> I can't share yet. I can't share yet, <laughs> but we're 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 optimistic about like Okay. Yeah, we're very optimistic right now. Knowing all what you know after seven years in the media business, if you could start Blockworks again from scratch, how would you go about it? I would have bet on ourselves earlier with our own content earlier. We Again, we wasted a couple of years not doing that. Um, here's, here's what I think is happening in media today. So what's happening in media is you had all of these venture-backed businesses, me media is dying. I would say, I don't know if anyone pays attention to the BuzzFeeds and Voxes and Vices of the world and Coindesk sold to Bullish and the block had, was taking money under the table from SBF, right? To like, you know, fund themselves and stuff. Like media is a very, very, very tough business. Um, the model for media, I think in today's world has to be B2B media. So not B2C, it has to be B2B media with a product that sits at the bottom of the funnel. So if you look at what's happened over the last like 10 years with media, you had media was basically all just an attention game. So you had all of these 
BuzzFeed, Vox, Vice, Huffington Post, all, all complex, all of these people raised hundreds of millions of dollars to try to sprint and create more content. And they were built on the back of these platforms. They're built on the back of social networks. And that actually worked for a while. Like BuzzFeed's fun, uh, funding deck said, a media company built on Facebook, right? Optimized for Facebook. What happened was, and that was, and that was working really, really well. In 2015 and 2016, everything basically changed. And what changed was back before then, you saw a link on social media and you just kind of clicked it. You remember the surveys, BuzzFeed surveys from fat friends and you would just, social media was relatively new and you would kind of just click something if you saw it. And then uh, fake news, mm. the fake news media kind of thing started happening and people started trusting these links less and less. And there was all this talk about Russia kind of, planting the election with Facebook and Trump getting elected and all, all that kind of stuff. And that really changed the game. That was, that was one element that changed the game for media companies is people stopped just clicking random links. They started focusing on the, the underlying brand behind the link. So that was one change. The second change was uh, what BuzzFeed and Vox and Vice and all these people failed to understand is that you can raise a lot of money for a software business or an AI company today and actually build much faster and have more success than someone who raises less money, right? There's actually a correlation with how much money you raise. Um, with media, media is just a trust and reputation game. And if I had to circle one of those words, it's just a trust game. And what those companies fail to understand is that you can't spend money to mm. buy trust. Mm. So they bought page views, they bought clicks, they bought subscribers, but they didn't buy trust. And so when we moved from a world of clicks and just how big is your audience into a world of trust and reputation building and affinity with a brand, those that's you can it's a peak up and then 2016 is a peak down for those companies and they all started to get crushed. So as that relates to building a media company today, I think you really have to focus on building this top of funnel that is an owned, not a rented audience. So it's a audience that podcast downloads and newsletter subscribers, not focused on web traffic or social media followers. And then you need a product that sits at the bottom of the funnel so that you can build this kind of like negative customer acquisition cost model into the SaaS product. There's a lot there, but hopefully that that's kind of my like thesis on how I think the best media companies will be built today. How important is the data business in there? The data part of the business? So the data business is incredibly important. It is, you can think of our business like a funnel. So top of funnel is paid, uh, the website traffic and social paid, so, uh, social followers and stuff like that. I don't even pay attention to those numbers really. A little lower on the funnel is newsletter subscribers and podcast downloads. That's where you start getting into top of funnel, but the owned audience. Then you go lower on the funnel and you have conferences, digital asset summit and permissionless. The whole thing functions because there's a subscription business at the bottom that is a and we, we all know SaaS is a beautiful business model. Mm -hmm. The problem with SaaS companies is they were built on this fallacy that you could raise a bunch of money, spend half of that on product and engineering, and half of that on sales and marketing and customer acquisition. And what we've learned by seeing the failure of a lot of these SaaS companies is that the customer acquisition part of that equation, companies were spending far too much money to acquire customers. So SaaS in and of itself as a business model is a beautiful business model, right? You get these recurring, recurring revenue and all that very sticky customers and stuff like that. What's broken about it is the customer acquisition part of that equation. Mm. So our business is, we have this nice, actually negative customer acquisition cost model where we own the relationship with the audience and we're getting paid to have that audience and to have the customers that then funnel into the research platform. So mm -hmm. let's say, let's say Blockworks analytics and research and stuff existed by itself. What we have to do is build a massive sales team and a massive marketing team and go spend a bunch of money sponsoring conferences and sponsoring podcasts and driving inbound leads and the brand awareness stuff that all these other brands have to do. We don't, we've never spent a dollar marketing Blockworks research and analytics. We've been around for two years. The inbound leads basically come to us. And they're not even coming from elsewhere. They're coming from our newsletters and our podcasts and our webinars and things like that. So it's this very nice, like, kind of funnel that we've built. And uh, the last thing I'd say on this is there are a lot of businesses in crypto that do a similar thing. There's data businesses and analytics businesses. There's conferences. There's podcasts and newsletters. 
there's news businesses. The thing that I kind of talk about internally is like we refer to it as our unfair advantage internally is nobody has the combination of all four of those, right? Mm. The news business builds trust. The podcasts and newsletters build distribution and audience. The conference business spits off the cash flow. And the research and data business is helps us with the enterprise valuation of the company, right? You said before you raised $12 million, right? Mm -hmm. How did raising $12 million operate the, uh, change the way you operate the company? It raised the stakes. It, um, we were, we, you know, we bootstrapped for the first six years. Like we, we just had, we, we had to be profitable. And so we did things, we played it a little safer. We took those big risks that I talked about, but we played it a little safer. Um, and the, the kind of exit, if we ever sold or went public or anything, it was, it, you know, it was probably no shot of going public if we didn't have this um, other side of the business, it was just a nice like kind of cash flowing business. When we raised money, we immediately, what that does is it's a promise to someone else that you're going to get them a return on their capital. Mm. And this isn't a one-to-one -one return, right? This is a large, there's an expectation of a large return here. And we talked for a long time. We talked for years about if we should do it. And we didn't do it for years because we weren't confident that that would, that, honestly, that that would come. And it was only once we got extreme confidence in ourselves and in the business that we could have a extremely outsized potential outcome at some point in the, probably not near future, but lo long-term future, um, did we raise capital. So the stakes got increased and it made the business, we now focus a lot more on the analytics and research and data side of the business because that's where a lot of the enterprise valuation of the company will come from. Mm. And the conferences and the podcasts and newsletters are growing incredibly nicely, but it's no longer just the core focus anymore. There's now these, there's, there's, there's a lot of different things to kind of make sure that the, that, that the whole plan works. How do you stay kind of true and authentic to the initial kind of brand and vibe that you wanted to give once you raise capital, right? Because now you're saying, we are focusing mm. on the business more. Maybe this has or might have affected even the way you do podcasting, mm. right? Or charge for podcasting. Because at the moment you start to, the moment you raise money, you kind of owe, as you said, right? You owe to someone and you need to probably make some changes that might affect the brand itself, right? Yeah. So there are things you could do if you wanted to generate short-term cash flow and look good on a board deck or go raise another round. And... That I think is the, maybe that would be tempting to do if we hadn't seen so many failures in that bucket. So let's say an example, like, you you know, we could take payment for someone to come on our podcast. Like someone would probably pay like, I don't know, probably I'm sure you get this all the time. Like someone could pay $10,000 mm. or 20, might offer $20,000 to be a guest on the podcast. But the second you start doing that, you lose the <laughs> one over. word that we circled earlier, which is trust. Yeah, 100%. right. So if we were trying to, absolutely sprint and sell the company. Let's say we're trying to sprint and sell the company next year or something. I mean, we're, we're taking all those deals. We're doing all those things, but we don't do a single one of those things because yeah, I think that, I mean, blockers can get a hundred times larger than it is today, but it only works like that if we, if it's built on trust. So it just depends, I think for the game that the game you're trying to play and the outcome you're trying to make. How do you deal with the pressure that comes with raising money? Thankfully, so we made a very conscious decision not to go do a large raise. We only raised 12 million and we only did it from three investors who we had extreme trust in. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people do these party rounds or they raise from 40 people. We raised from Santiago, who's the co-host of the Empire podcast. We raised from Framework, Michael mm -hmm. and Vance, who at the time were co-hosting. Actually, they still are co-hosting our Bell Curve podcast. So we had deep amounts of trust with them. And then we raised from... Dan Tapiero, who's the founder of 10T and 1RT, who has been coming and speaking at our events for five years. Mm. And so, you know, we had had people want to invest over the years, but no one who we really, really, really deeply trusted. And uh, I don't actually feel a lot more pressure. I had these, I mean, the day after we closed the raise, uh, you know, went and had these ex pretty extreme, like, things called cluster headaches, which we can talk about if you're interested, but which was, you know, I think came from the stress. But um, right now I don't feel like it adds an extreme amount of extra pressure because we, I, Mike and I put enough 
pressure on ourselves already, I think. So you just shared with me something you've been afraid to share publicly until now. It's called cluster headaches, right? Cluster headaches is a very painful type of headache. It usually occurs in periods of frequent, frequent attacks known as clusters. These headaches cause intense pain in or around one eye on one side of the head. When did you first experience these cluster headaches? So, yeah, for context, so yeah, they're called, they're, it's trigeminal autocephalalgia, I think is the name. They're known as suicide headaches and, uh, or some people call them cluster attacks. I started having them undiagnosed my junior year of college. So the first time I got them was junior year of college and then they started coming roughly every couple of years and then it became every year um, and then it became twice a year. And what they are is basically a series of, um, they're, they're, they're called cluster attacks because they come, the, the kind of attacks come in uh, like a, a, a cluster, basically, for, for lack of a better word. And they'll come for about a month and I'll have two or three a day and then they go away. Um, so the, I, yeah, I can talk more about the experience if, if, if it's interesting. I don't know if it's interesting for people. But Why is it called su suicide headache? The rate of suicide in people with cluster attacks is, depending on the study and the data, between nine to 11 times higher than the average gener than the average population. And it's not because people want to, what, what happens in a lot of these suicides is it's not the it's not that people want to kill themselves or that they don't like their life. It's that they, or they're not depressed or anything like that. It's that they want to get rid of the pain in the moment. So there's a, um, uh, there's a guy, there's a, there's a, there's a pain scale that neurologists and pain doctors use. And, uh, it goes something like this. It's like, I think arthritis is maybe a three out of 10 or a four out of 10. Uh, fractured bone is I think a 5.2 out of 10. Um, uh, migraines are maybe a six and a half or a six, I think a six and a half or a seven out of 10 for some really bad ones. Uh, trying to think of other examples on, on, on the pain scale, a childbirth is a 9.1 or a 9.3 out of 10 and cluster attacks are a 10 out of 10 on mm -hmm. that pain scale. There's a doctor, um, a neurologist in, uh, and I think in Houston, his name is Mark, Mark Burrish. He, he's the, he's kind of the leading like pain guy neurologist in the U S right now. His words, not mine, are that cluster attacks are the most painful physical feeling uh, a human can endure that he knows of. And so I think this, yeah, this, this, the suicide element of that just comes from trying to get the pain away. I can completely understand when you say it's not because they're depressed, but it's because they want, you know, in that moment, you have something that happens in your mind that you want, for example, taking the pain away. Because I was actually suicidal for like a couple of months many wow. years ago when I had like, for three years I had really terrible health issues. And at some point something switched in my mind, right? And I couldn't even sleep alone anymore. Yeah. I had to sleep with friends because I couldn't trust myself, right? And it's not, it sounds so weird to talk about that, but like it's not, and I've been pretty open about it, but it's, it's not like, oh, I'm so sad, I need attention. Everybody thinking like someone who commits suicide is because of the lack of attention mm -hmm. or I'm so depressed. No, no, no. It's like you have literally something like an impulse. I always call it kind of a sneeze, right? If you sneeze, you're dead. Like you have to hold yourself from sneezing. So so when you say that, I really understand it uh, in terms of- uh, So what ch what changed? I know this is your podcast, not mine, but I'm uh, like, what, what, what happened? How did you get out of that? Uh, I had to do like very kind of intense protocols, not like nine days water fasting, wow. go on like one year, like off. It's, this could be an entire podcast. Okay, like, next time. Next <laughs> <it's> time. <hell. laughs> I discovered biohacking, fasting. I mean, yeah. biohacking is a, is a word very used by too many people, but like I discovered basically Ayurvedic and Chinese herbs, uh, Ayurvedic water, fa yeah, wa yeah. Wire, water fasting. Yeah, yeah. I did probably 30 different things all at the same time that I tested for actually three years until I, I found a, a problem to a solution to my problem. Anyways, when you have this uh, cluster headache, how do you deal with them? Um, so sometimes I can kind of, so I, I, the fighting through the pain is impossible. Um, there's, there's no possible way to cope with the pain, I would say. So I have a, um, 
an injection called, I'm, I basically get loaded up with a, I get nerve blockers to basically block the pain from touch from like there's, there's nerve, there's nerves in your brain uh, that go into your brain. Uh, you have all these nerves, right? That go into your head. Um, the occipital nerve, trigeminal nerve. This is a mind, uh, the cl cluster attacks basically pound on the trigeminal nerve. So I get nerve blocker injections to block the feeling to the trigeminal nerve. I get, I go on a calcium channel blocker called verapamil. I get uh, hooked up to an oxygen tank when I'm on it. And then I have um, uh, sumatriptan injections, which are basically like a, re a rescue medication. And then every month I get three injections of a thing called emgality. Um, because there's different things that happen when you're, so right now, if you take all my levels and you take all my, testosterone and serotonin and dope and in uh, all, all of my levels and melatonin it's, it's all normal right now mm -hmm. but when i enter a cluster period there are different things that light up so one is my uh uh one is there's like cgrp basically i get ne neurological inflammation mm -hmm. from from, from a, like a cal calcium c calcium gene receptor peptide or something like that i get all of my hormones and all of that stuff gets pretty out of whack so serotonin and dopamine and melatonin and all, and all of that stuff gets kind of out of whack. And then um, uh, there, there's, uh, and then uh, my, my hypothalamus starts light, lighting up basically. So there's Western medication, which is all the things I just mentioned. And then there's uh, psilocybin is basically the most studied, you know, you know, we spoke with Yale, we spoke with Princeton, we spoke with, uh, 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 Houston, uh, some, uh, Houston, I forget the university in Houston, uh, or maybe it was university of Austin. We spoke with Johns Hopkins, uh, the places that are doing cluster headache research. Mm. And they said, look, there's, there's Mgality, there's Verapamil, there's Sumatriptan. There's all these things that you're taking, but we've had really good studies that are showing that psilocybin is, uh, is just is just as effective or nearly as effective as or maybe even more effective than some of these other things so and the reason for that is psil psilocybin breaks psychedelics break down into i uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the scientific name for them but it's like um there's the there, there's one bucket which is like psilocybin there's psilocybin lsds lsas things like that and then uh dmt 5-MeO, DMT, things like that. And then there's another bucket, which is more like, um, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting that uh, ayahuasca and what is it, mezcaline, whatever, whatever the name is. The first bucket breaks down into LSAs, L LSD, things like that. The first bucket is, those are known as triptans. And triptans are psilocybin. So if you actually look at the molecule of psilocybin next to the molecule of the rescue medication I get called sumatriptan, right? Mm. My rescue medication is literally called sumatriptan. Psilocybin is a triptan. Mm. The molecule nearly looks identical. So they've started, yeah, doing a lot of studies with psilocybin and there's been some pretty amazing results as well. So the, my current neurologist is, 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 is pushing me to, yeah, do like basically like experiment with that. Haven't done it yet. I have, I, the worst cluster period I ever experienced was last summer um was july it usually lasts for about four to six weeks this lasted for three or four months it was july august july august september and october and um basically entered a period i had to take a couple of weeks off of work um i couldn't i couldn't respond to slacks i couldn't be on the phone i just kind of sat on the couch and like watched tv and just couldn't and just two or three times a day would I'd get my cluster. I, my wife would give me an injection. I'd wait for a couple hours. I'd feel like crap from the injection. And then I'd get another cluster and then I'd have that and I'd be hooked up to the oxygen tank. And that lasted for a couple of weeks. Um, and I just basically entered this period of like extreme desperation. Mm -hmm. And so I, that was the first time experimenting with psilocybin for as a way to hopefully kind of cure and fix the, the cluster attacks. What was the result? The result? Honestly, it was that the first time was great. The second time I ended up getting a horrible cluster attack while on psilocybin. And it was such a terrifying experience that I didn't end up doing it again. Yeah. But my neurologist wow. is, uh, 
optimistic that I should, I should keep doing this. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was, I mean, it was, it was, it was pretty horrifying. Yeah. It's crazy though. Like I, I have such a good support system and like, you know, I've got a team at Blockworks that knows about this and steps up when it happens. I've got uh, a wife who's extremely supportive. I've got a co-founder who's extremely supportive. I've got the financial means to pay for any of these drugs that insurance doesn't cover. And the, as you go through this, like you just realize how messed up the healthcare system is oh, and how God. horrendous. I mean, there was just a psilocybin uh, MDMA was supposed to be approved for, for vets last week and it, and it got denied. And you just like everything from the like approval of these drugs all the way to, you know, I'd have to spend uh, Kennedy, Kennedy, my wife would, would, would spend it during this time, like three or four hours on the phone, try, just trying to get the oxygen tank re refilled. And it's, um, you know, I've got everything in the world you could ask for from a support level and from, you know, I'm a naturally very happy guy and from financial means. And even for, even for me, it's extremely tough just dealing with the, the, I'd put quotes around like the system or the bureaucracy of, of getting help around this time. It makes you think. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I remember when I was being, so actually I got fucked by the healthcare system itself. I was taking a pill mm -hmm. that was supposed to help me and it destroyed me even more. And then you're supposed to take even more pills, which I didn't. That's why I went the kind of uh, uh, alternative medicine way and fasting way and all that stuff. Right. But what I realized was, and thank God I was building my first company. So, I mean, I was sort of, but like I was spending probably half of the time in bed looking at the, the ceiling. Right. But, and, and then selling for the rest of the time. And I, I was a bit lucky to, 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 to manage a few of these sales. So I had, I had enough money to pay for, or again, as you say, right. For all these, you know, psychologists, uh, CBT treatments, everything. But I was just realizing, man, it's, like, it's really a, a vicious, a vicious circle, right? Mm -hmm. Because first, no one understand anything. Second, no one really seemed to care. Like everybody's too caught up, even like doctors and the whole system, right? Then they try to sell some pills, but these pills have negative side effects, but they don't really think about it or they don't really know about it. And then you're just there, you feel completely alone. And if you don't have the means, what the fuck do you even do? Yeah. Because if you don't have the means, you're already feeling like you're being fucked by everything and you don't even have money, right? To, 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 to take care of your, or your, of your health. It's, it's really, yeah. it's so fucked up. Like, yeah. It's so fucked up. It's horrible. I mean, there's a really good organization called Cluster Busters. If I don't know if maybe one person <laughs> listening to this might also have cluster attacks, but there's an organization called Cluster Busters and they, my, yeah, yep. my wife and I give a lot to them because they real they're the only org they're like an advocacy organization like just trying to help uh, like yeah just help folks with cluster headaches it's um rare diseases are tough right because the money is in cancer and alzheimer's it's in cancer because because so many people get cancer and so many people get alzheimer's um and uh and i understand and the, the, the way that the economics work is the money should go into the thing that has the biggest outcome there's no so there, therefore there's there's no money that goes into like trying to fix a cluster headache because so few people have it. Mm. So it's tough. Why did you wait so long to talk about it publicly? Yeah, my wife has been pushing me to to talk about it or write an op-ed or there's like national cluster headache day. And it, it, I think it makes you feel a little, uh, seem a little weak in the eyes of, let's say we were ever to, you know, go raise another round or uh, try to sell the company or something. I think I think there is a perception that it, Ah, is this, does this person have a problem? Are they, are they not healthy? Are they, mm. are they psychologically weak? And even if people won't, um, consciously admit it, I think there is a subconscious that happens there. Um, and I, I remember, so I got these clusters in July and August and stuff like that, but I was just coming off the, the back of another period of clusters in February and March. And this is when we were in the heart of fundraising in the beginning of 2023. And the market was like the depths of the bear market. And so I was in another period of clusters and uh, I remember being on a fundraising call with Mike and our, they weren't our investors at the time. And I'm on the call and my, I tech and I get a cluster headache on the call and my right eye starts shutting and Mike can see it. Cause you start crying, like mm -hmm. tearing your right eye shuts and my whole face starts to droop. And I text Dana and she comes in the room and she like kind of kneels down. So she's not on the camera during this fundraising call. And she gives me a shot in my thigh. And I just like, it was, I mean, it's, it's intense. So I'm, I, I think I wanted, I wanted to talk about it on here just because, you know, I think so many founders, the job of a founder is basically enduring 
pain 24 seven. And at, if at any given point in your company's in your company building, you don't feel pain, I think it's the natural reaction of the founder. I'm not talking about physical pain. I'm talking about like mental mm. pain. It is the natural reaction to take on more pain. So I'm not, I'm not feeling enough pain. There's, there's more I could take on. There's more mm. this company could take on. So you're kind of in a state of, of pain. And, uh, there's this book, I haven't even read it, but some friends have told me about it. It's, it's called the, the, um, the body wears the pain or the, the body keeps the score or something like that. Mm. And I think the gist is something like a lot of your maybe mental pain or stress or whatever anxiety ends up exerting it, itself in physical form. And I've, I've just seen, and even in just block works, like I've got these clusters, Mike had, you know, Mike was out, Mike had to stay in bed for two weeks because of pretty debilitating back pain. Like that shouldn't be happening to a 30 year old. And I think it comes from it's a sign. stress and anxiety Absolutely. and stuff. And there's, there's so many founders in crypto that go through this. I mean, I have friends and you know, they're, they're rapidly losing their hair or they're, they have extreme back pain or they have cluster attacks as well. I've, there's another founder who has these cluster attacks, like, but nobody feels comfortable talking about it. So I'm wondering if by talking about it publicly, it gets other people more comfortable talking about it. Could be a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> my, my really regret we'll, this. <laughs> we'll find out. I understand what you're saying because when I was feeling terrible, I was also thinking, oh man, if I talk about, I mean, there's some people you can openly share, right? Then there's some people you can't, especially when it comes to money, are you investing in me, et cetera, or you're going to be a customer, et cetera. But what I realized, the more I shared, the more vulnerability is a superpower because it's very likely when you share, even if it's like that big investor that you've always seen as someone who is like super successful or famous or, you know, intimidating, this person is very likely to either himself or herself have some sort of issues or know someone very close to them mm -hmm. who have some sort of issues, right? And the moment you open, obviously you need to be, you need to be functionable, kind of prove, Hey, look, I can still do this sure, thing. Right. Sure. But the moment you open up, you get connected so much faster and so much closer because either you make them f think of themselves, either about their wife or their kids are, oh, and then you start to talk about that. Right. And what I realized is that actually, it's actually, I don't want to say I used it as a, as a tactic. Uh, to get closer faster, but actually the more, because as you said, so many people are so scared to talk about whether mental health issues or burnout or other type of issues, the more when you do it, actually, even if your condition is rare, many people suffer from, uh, it, it's almost impossible to have like a perfect life without any problem. And I, what mm. I realized is it's actually very helpful to create a deeper uh, relationship very fast, mm. even with people who you might think are the goats or you need to look perfect too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Most people st struggle from some sort of physical ailment or, men or mental yeah. ailment yeah. and uh, rarely talk about it. So I think crypto is such a violent industry in the emotional swings that people go through. And, uh, the 24 seven nature of the industry and just the volatility. It, um, I think it takes a toll on people <laughs> that if I think if you, some of the stuff I'm like, just, just deal with it. Other things I'm like, I think if people did talk about it a little bit more, it would be helpful. So we'll see what comes of this. Uh, we'll see what comes of mentioning that I have I held back on talking about it for several years. I think people but, will love it. Yeah. I appreciate it a lot. And I really appreciate that you shared it here. Yeah. Back to the founder's life. <laughs> As a founder, <laughs> you, how do you see it bef between execution and thinking, right? Because we tend to be so focused in the execution, yeah. but sometimes you need to take a step back and think. Um, the way that I tend to operate, not because, and this isn't a conscious decision, it's a subconscious decision, I think, or just the way that my body works, or maybe they're tied to these cluster attacks or whatever, I don't know why, is I go through these periods of extreme uh, exertion where I'm working what feels like 24 seven, you know, I'm at the office till 11 last night. I'm up at 6am, go to the gym. I'm stay at the office till 11 again tonight. I'm up at 5am for the gym and working on 12 hours on Sunday. And like that is that those time periods are t times I think when I know what the work that needs to be done is. Um, 
And I ju- we just have to sprint and do the work. And that's not just me. It's the whole company. It's we just have to sprint and do the work. Then at some period of time, let's say a couple months of doing that, th- I think there's a natural pullback that ends up happening, either personally, where I start to feel tired or I start to say, yeah, this 11, 11 or you know, midnight at the office every night is not working. And the early mornings at the gym are not working. I got to pull back a little bit. Or it's driven by, hey, look, we were trying to push this massive boulder up a hill. It's at the top of the hill. Now we have to go find the next hill to go push this boulder up. Um, that tends to drive back this period of like a little more reflection, a little more learning. Um, so an example of this could be, I don't know, figuring out the like data and analytics business. Like there's a period at which you have to sprint and you have to ship product and you have to build product and you have to go get your data customers and you have to get the marketing page lined up and you have to launch it and you have to do all those things. And that's a period of sprinting. And then there's a period of like, there's a period of learning, which is, hey, how does the API business really work? Hey, there's all these Kaiko and Amber data and Flipside and Dune and API. Do we want to be one of them? Do we like their business model? That's a period of learning and reflection. So I think I ebb and flow through these natural cycles. Um, that's 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 how I think about that. You talk about the heel and then the next heel, right? And then the next heel. Do you feel like it's never enough? Yeah, but I think that's associated with a bad thing. And like, I, I've never had more fun. Mm. And I think it's a cliche thing to say, but like never have never had more fun than like just what I do at Blockworks. Like I, I, I've never had Sunday scaries in seven years. I've never like, I mean, it's easily the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, but I've never, you know, I, I love, I love the Hills. Like, I think that's, you can have a really easy life if you don't contribute much to society. And for me, I think that the thing that ends up bringing me fulfillment, I think hap- there's happiness and fulfillment. Fulfill, I think I'm extremely fulfilled by pushing the boulder up the hill. On a day-to-day basis, does it make me happy uh, dealing with, let's say, people problems or sales <laughs> issues? It's, it doesn't make me happy, but it makes me extremely fulfilled. And there's like nothing else in this life I would rather do. Are you aiming for for happiness at some point? I feel I am. I am actually an extremely happy person. <laughs> I do like. I do. I you know. My I get crap from my friend. I wake up on the right side of the bed every day. Like I'm not. I'm not a very stressed out person. Um, I don't really have much anxiety. Like I am. I feel very blessed that like I am actually. Everyone who knows me, I think, would say I'm a very happy person. Mm-hmm. Um, I would be. I could be. I'm not sure. It's even happiness is the right word. I could have a much easier life mm. if I. When took a nine to five job or something, but, but you'll be much less fulfilled and much less, much less yeah. happy. A- absolutely. And one of the key point things, I mean, also very cliche, but I realized in the, in the last couple of years is actually happiness comes from struggling. It sounds so mm-hmm. cliche. It's what Gary V always says, right? But it's never, I don't know, raising the 12 million or getting valued that much or getting on the top of this hill. It's actually the struggle to get there that actually makes you happy every day because, uh, it's, I mean, I think it's Andrew Tate who said that. He says like, you're never happier than when you know that you're trying your best, right? Basically, you don't have unfulfilled potential. It doesn't mean that you're gonna be successful at the thing, right? But it means, you know, man, I've tried my best, right? Like for example, I came here to the US to record some podcasts. I was like, okay, I'll just line up a few podcasts. And then for the other ones, I'll just see who is down and like with introduction, I might end up taking planes, 19 hours, 15 hours time difference, spending a couple of weeks, spending quite a lot of money, a lot of time I could have done something else, et cetera. And maybe have a lot of these podcasts canceled or nothing happening or whatever, but like at least when something ha- doesn't happen, right? I- I- I've tried my best. I came here, I did yeah, the yeah, thing, yeah. right? And then you're like- Yeah, the thing that leads to like, I think frustration in my mind is when I feel like I am not exerting 100% of my effort. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know, you like, I have a lot of friends and fo- you know, whatever, family members who don't, who don't run their own business, obviously. And, um, you know, like this past Sunday, I worked from 9, 9 a.m. until 9 p.m. And then I went to the gym at 9.30. And that does not look like happiness. <laughs> or ind- someone looks at that and they're like, that sounds miserable. That sounds awful. <laughs> I loved, I, I had love the best it. day Sunday. Yeah. I had the best day. I so uh, it's not always like hard work and happiness aren't always like a one-to-one thing, you know? Uh, 
either inverse or 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 actually correlated. It's basically the there is nothing else I'd rather be doing right now, even if it's 2 a.m. than what I'm doing right now. That's happiness, yeah. right? Even if it's like working on the next right. peach deck or the next. So, so like my so my co-founder and I sit down at the end of every quarter and we we have a review session for each other. And we sit down and we say, what what are what do I think you're doing a good job at? What do I think you're doing a bad job at? What do I think I'm doing a good job at? What am I think I'm doing a bad job at? And what am I love? What am I loving doing? And what am I really disliking right now? Mm. And there have been times in Blockworks Blockworks's history, many times actually, where there are things that maybe the business would be best if we kept doing that thing. Like, 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 like Mike, Mike is amazing at like content and crap. Like, what should this podcast look like? And what should we be covering in the news? And what should this research report? But let's say there's a day when Mike is really burned out. Maybe I'll take that off his plate and I'll probably do 80% of as good of a job or 50% mm -hmm. of as good of a job as Mike at that. But we'll be able to build this business for 20 years mm -hmm. because we just keep loving it and enjoying it. So there's this trade-off where I see other founders fail is they just, they're like, I, I, I fucking hate this thing, but yeah. I just have to do it to make the business work when there are options to get that off their plate, you know? The burnout never comes from uh, overworking or working a lot. It comes from working on things that are not meaningful. Yeah, not doing things that you enjoy mm -hmm. doing. Absolutely. So, yeah. Very underrated, actually. A hundred percent. Yeah, but burnout rarely, maybe never from in my life has come from overworking. It's not It's not working too much. It's It's, yeah, it's doing things that, like you said, don't, that you don't enjoy and that don't bring you fulfillment and that you don't, I think there's two types of people in the world. There are people who they end every day and you ask them, how was your day? And they said, it was a great day. I got so much done. I accomplished so much today. And there are people who you say, how was your day? And they said, it was a great day. I had the most interesting conversations. Mm. I learned the most interesting things. There's this new idea that popped into my head. There are burnout oftentimes comes from when people who get fulfillment in life from achievements and accomplishing things and checking things off to-do lists are stuck in the conversations and ideas bucket. And the ideas people get burnt out when they're trying to do things that are just like trying to achieve and mm. to-do lists and pushing a boulder up a hill. So that's, I'm, I'm a end the day, I got so much done. Mike is a end the day, I learned so many new things. So we try to separate our work kind of into those buckets. There are many good books on web too, right? About the soft side of building companies, which is not enough talked about in crypto. So let's talk about it. Okay. How is a company going from zero to one, uh, from zero to 10 employees or one to 10 employees different from a company going from 10 to 50 employees? There have been different moments in Blockworks where we got stuck at a certain employee size. And I, at, at the time, I thought it was because of sales issues or product issues. The product wasn't good enough or, um, you know, maybe the brand wasn't strong enough, whatever it may be. Looking back, I think it was all because of almost organizational, like, setup. Mm. And what I mean by that is I think if you look at companies, they tend to, the, the like, one to ten, there's a system that works. The founder is extremely involved in everything. Uh, and the people that you hire are kind of jack of all trades. Then what starts to happen between like 10 to 50 is you start to, people start to specialize in things, but you don't really need like a leadership team or an exec team. You can still have a bunch of like jack knives and jack of all trades and Swiss army knives and things like that. Um, but around 50 people, you need, you need leaders inside your company. And so we kind of woke up at around 50 employees. I think we got stuck at 50 employees for maybe two years. Um, we said, I mean, this business just feels so damn hard. Why does this business feel so hard to run? And, uh, you know, we talked to a lot of people about it. And the thing that we realized was we didn't have like a leadership team. We didn't have a, we didn't have like extremely, we didn't have people to kind of help us run the business. It was just Mike and I and like a bunch of, I mean, a bunch of like, I don't know, younger, <laughs> younger folks, I guess. And they were amazing, yeah. like uh, hustlers and stuff like that. But there was no kind of structure. So at 50 people, we started to, the thing that kind of helped us burst past that, and we have around 75 today, is we got 
the most amazing, you know, the person who leads our editorial team joined Coindesk in 2013 mm. and then helped build the block, right? The woman leading our events has built and, built and sold two event businesses and has been in the events world for 20 years. Our CTO is like an absolute wizard. We've got a head of people who, you know, just like could, could not have asked for a better person there. We've got a VP of research and, and the information side who was at Anchorage and Bloomberg for several years and head of listings at Binance and just like a, a, a wonderful human. And we've got all these like amazing people who are now taking us from 50 to, I would guess we probably hit 150 people. And the system that we've created has, is going to com completely crumble. So yeah, when I look out at other founders, oftentimes I see them saying this is something at the company broke, but I don't know what. Something stopped working. Our mm. product stopped working. Users stopped liking us. And usually it doesn't actually come from that. Oftentimes it comes from an organizational thing that is broken, that is trickling all the way down through the front end of your platform into, into the users. Um, but maybe it's not a product thing that's broken. It's an organizational thing that's broken. One of the most important things to do to go from one to 10 or 10 to 50 is obviously hiring people. How do you maximize the chances of hiring the right people at the first shot? We got, we got this wrong so many times, I would say. Um, so the first is I think you need your non-negotiables. So the, the non-negotiables that we have are we need curious people. So the trait that we need is curious people. Um, and the reason for that is because we've had people join BlockWorks. They're the, 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 the best engineers in the world or the best salespeople in the world, but the industry moves too quickly mm. for you not to be curious. So we need naturally very curious people, the types of people who go down Wikipedia rabbit holes at 2 a.m. in the morning. So we need, you have to have your non-negotiables. For us, that's curiosity. And then that's the, the airport test. And the airport test is just, if I was traveling with this person and our flight got delayed, mm and we were stuck at the airport bar for eight hours, am I, gonna, am I gonna text my friend and say, oh my God, I'm stuck at the airport with this person for eight hours, what do I do? Or am I gonna say, oh my God, that's so cool, I get to have some beers with this person. Mm. So, you know, we're at 75 people today, 75 out of 75 are naturally curious and they pass the airport test. From there, I think you can start to get into all the more like kind of cliche, classic advice around hiring. Um, the last step of, the thing we got wrong a lot was when we were hiring the leadership team and hiring executives at the company was we ran them through the standard interview process. But what we missed was for that group of people, it becomes a lot more about how you think than how do you do your work. Mm. There's how do you do your work and that's all important and can you get shit done, obviously. But what we started doing is these in-person, we'll fly someone into New York and we basically will send them the things that we'll, we'll just brain dump on a Google Doc, the problems at the business in their line of business, right? Mm. Here, here are the three or four things that we're thinking about. Here are the here are the here are, here are the metrics around this business. Here's the context that you need. How, how would you solve these things? And we'll spend an entire day. We do breakfast, then we whiteboard, then we do lunch, then we whiteboard, go for some drinks, have dinner, talk more about the problems. Because if you are misaligned on how you think about things, it will never work. If you're aligned on how you think about things, you can let them figure out how to do the work, but it needs to come from an alignment around how to think about the problem. But aren't you supposed to hire people, especially key people, to tell you how to do something, right? Tell you how to do something, yes. But we have a core, they have to, the how I let, the how is up to them. The like what to do, so like, should we, here's a, here's an example. Should we expand BlockWorks conferences into Asia? It's a real question we've, we've, we've thought about. So once we make that decision, totally on them to execute and figure out how we do that. How mm. do we get a partner on the ground? And if we're going to, mm. you know, Hong Kong or something, the how is they can figure that out. They're the, they're the owner of that PNL basically. The what is I need to see how do you come to the conclusion and what is your logic as you're starting to like problem solve around that. Mm. And if I just can't follow your logic and I can't start to like understand how you think about a problem like this, it's going to be really tricky to work together. How does the cyclicality of the crypto market affect how hard it is 
to build a company in the space, especially when it comes to people. There's the obvious thing around like financials and making sure you don't get over your skis and have to do big layoffs and stuff like that. But I think that's a relatively obvious answer. The tough thing that people don't talk about enough is the the people management gets very tricky in cycles because it's basically a big game of setting people's expectations. So I think you have three, you have three jobs as a founder. You have to set the vision. You have to basically set the strategy, set the, set the vision. You have to get everyone to row together. And then you have to determine the speed mm. at which they are rowing. Those are like the only jobs in my mind of a founder. Early days, you have other jobs, sales, marketing. But like as the company grows, those are the three roles. Set the strategy, set the speed, set the like getting everyone synced up together. Call it the three S's or something. Um, that all starts to break down if you're not with, with these violent cycles up and down, if you're not really clearly setting expectations. So here's an example. Here, here's an example of something that's going to happen. Actually, here, here are two examples. It was the heart of the bear market. Uh, uh, and every company was struggling in crypto. This is probably July of 2023. And Mike and I said, it's time to start turning on the gas. Maybe this is October or November 2023. Said, it's time to start hiring again. Time to turn on the gas. And I think people basically looked at us like we were like we were lunatics. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, like you know, we're in the, we're in the two-year bear market right now. In 2022, almost 2023 is over. Why would we start hiring? And it's because of an expectation around how these cycles work. And I think the same thing will be happening, will happen again. Let's say it's Bitcoin's at 150, Sol just hit a thousand, ETH is at 8K or 10K or whatever, like, and it's, you know, fall of 2025. Mike and I are gonna have to go to the company and say, let's slow things down. Mm. Let's stop hiring. And the reaction we'll get from every single person is that, that's insane. Like we're leaving so much growth on the table, mm -hmm. but you start to have to like, I think plan for these. Yeah. Plan, you have to, it, it, it makes business planning very, very tricky. It's the same as investing actually, actually in the coins. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. When it's, do it's I get similar. in and when do I get out or when yeah. do I accumulate and when do I, I mean, you start to see the world in the older I get, the more I see the world in just markets. Right. So <laughs> like, the the talent market is an interesting market in crypto mm -hmm. because in the bear market, you can hire the most amazing people for relative, like for what I'd call normal prices yeah. or call, yeah. like, you know, that's their salary we're talking about. But like, if it was a market, like yeah. prices, like <laughs> when the bull market comes, I mean, we had, we had people getting, they were making X amount and they were getting offers for not 20% increase or 30% increase, but 2.5x offers. <laughs> so, you know, you have someone making 100K who gets an offer for 220. How, right? did, how did you deal with that? <laughs> um, we dealt with it the complete wrong way at the time, which was, oh, we, we, we did some things, right? We, you know, I mean, you just can't entertain those because what ends up happening is like those people join those companies. But I know the, I know the market rate for all of these roles. And if it gets out ahead of its skis, those companies might get, have that person for a year. But when the market turns, they're unfortunately going to be the first to get laid off because their comp is out of whack. Let's say you have a team of five marketers and everyone makes 150K. But then you have one marketer who makes 250K because they got hired in the Pico bull market. Who's getting laid off when things turn? The person who makes 250. So I think you can't really succumb to those pressures when, when that happens. And you just have to make sure you have a good rotation bench of people um, but even, even like the advertising market works the same. I started seeing it just as a market. It's no different than the stock market. When everyone's panicked and freaked out, like advertising rates go down. And if you think about the a marketer as a portfolio manager who's allocating capital to get a return, no different than a portfolio manager and investor, they should be buying advertising in the bear markets. Now BlockWorks' ad rates are are expensive. They're, they're high because we're sold out through, I think, November right now for a lot of our digital inventory. So now you're, they're p paying a, a premium on the advertising. Mm. No different than if you're buying a stock in a, in a bull market. So it's, I've started seeing all these things as just markets. Yeah, but most people don't think that way, right? 
They, don't. They, do, they invest the wrong way, whether in stocks, crypto, or in advertising, or in anything, right? You look at... Uh, well, it's fear, right? Yeah, it's, absolutely. You, you make fear-based <laughs> decisions, which is easy. And sometimes there's other variables. It's like mm. maybe if you're an investor, you ran, ran out of dry powder. Maybe if you're a marketer, you've got a budget you have to work around. But uh, the savvy thing is to double down on hiring, double down on marketing, mm. double down on all of this stuff. I mean, Rolex, right? How did Rolex get so big in the US? They're primarily European brand. Rolex got was decently large in the US. When did they like take off and become Rolex? In 2008, the global financial crisis, all the watch brands stopped advertising in 2008 and 2009. Mm. Rolex 3 x their marketing budget mm. in 2008 in the United States. So I think um, there's, there's some good lessons there. You talked about 150K Bitcoin, 8 to 10K ETH, 1,000 Sol. I like that one. <laughs> Something that's potentially bullish for crypto are the elections coming, right? Bitcoin and crypto are now part of the US elections. And you guys got uh, into a lot of hits because of an article Blockworks posted, which starts by the following. Only a fool would vote on crypto alone. Americans should not prioritize their own selfish financial interest over broader societal and ethical concerns. Isn't it in human nature to be a free rider when it comes to personal financial interests? I don't think that article is necessarily about being a free rider. I think the, I think Molly Jane, the writer of that op-ed, her take on, her take on this was essentially vote, vote how you want to vote. Like vote, vote for Trump or for at that time, Biden or whoever you want to vote for. It, you know, it doesn't really matter to me, but she said there's, there's a lot of other things to consider uh, outside of just your monetary interests um, and that there's a lot of other things at stake and on the table. But that's what I say when, when I mean free rider, I'm, I'm more saying, yes, people should think that way. But probably most, most people think, ah, I need to think personally, right? Oh, my definitely. Own financial I mean, interest. The, I mean, the Therefore, that I'm we, a free, most people who are getting angry uh, yeah. are free, are free riders, basically, right? Yeah. And well, so I, I mean, I don't think they're necessarily free. Like, so maybe free riders the word here, but like, the pushback we got was, who are you to say that we shouldn't vote for our livelihood and for? I think there's a real concern right now that. Trump equals bull market, mm. regulatory clarity, massive boom for crypto, especially in the US. And the Democrats winning, and I think this is the concern right now that people have on Twitter, is that Kamala means four years of the same. Of Maybe it's not Gary Gensler anymore, but the SEC cracking down and lack of regulatory clarity. And that's been really hard for operators in crypto, mm. um, ourselves included. So... I don't, maybe, maybe the word is free riders, but I, the, the, the main pushback we got was who do you think you are to call me a fool? The fool, the word fool there was pretty intense. Mm. And, um, <laughs> uh, but it definitely, what I think it did, that article did was people weren't comfortable having that conversation. So nobody was open about talking about their politics on Twitter, unless you're maybe like a Selkist or something like that. Nobody was. And when I think of like one of the things that Blockworks needs to do before successful, it's move the conversation about crypto forward in a responsible way and to always sit at the cutting edge of crypto. And at that point in time, we accomplished both of those things. It was the talking about the intersection of politics and crypto was kind of the cutting edge. No one was really talking about it yet. Now everyone's talking about it. And we moved the conversation forward because people weren't willing to talk about it publicly. We published that and you had hundreds of people, I think maybe thousands of people saying, I love Molly's take. I hate Molly's take. Mm. Um, and it got the conversation going. Who are you voting for? Oh, tough, <laughs> tough. There's a long, <laughs> there is a, that is a, that is a, uh, longer question. Here's what I'd say. Actually, it's not a longer question. It's obviously a very simple question. I could say Trump or Kamala. Um, I think it's very obvious at this point that Trump would be much better for crypto in the United States. Um, and I think it's also obvious that 
Kamala would be better for other things. Definitely not crypto, right? She came out with her advisors. It's like Barat and people like that. Like it's not the thing that if, if you're optimizing solely for what is going to make crypto specifically in the US go much higher, it's a very easy choice, which is I think, which is I think Trump. That's my like very PRE. And, uh, and you answer. want obviously like you are a crypto guy, you have a company in crypto, like you so you you you're kind of thinking like these people kind of get angry online. Right? When, for example, you might think about, I don't know, you organize a conference, you say, okay, we're gonna have maybe some politicians, we're gonna have some uh, Republicans. And we're gonna have some Democrats and then people get super angry because why would you have some Democrats that are against crypto, right? Right, right. I mean, we have this conference coming up in October, permissionless, and we've got all the L1 founders and L2 founders and the BlackRock CIO and Chris Dixon and Balaji. And mm -hmm. we, but we also have both Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. who we've invited to come speak. And um, I think there was a, there was a take on Twitter that I actually vehemently disagree with, which is why are you platforming the Democrats? Mm. Why are you inviting the Democrats to come speak at your conference? Why do you let Wiley Nickel and Richie Torres and Ro Khanna, who are clearly you know associated with the bad guys, come speak at this event? And um, you know, I can understand people saying like you should vote for Trump because he'll be better for crypto. I just can't get behind the take of like you should blackball the the Dems and and only platform the Republicans, especially if you're a media company. Your yeah. role is to be unbiased, right? That's our yeah, exactly. If you want to be a media company that stays alive in the long run and that is not part of those that are dying, right? It's absolutely that. So it makes a lot of sense. So I, and it's fair if people push back, but I yeah. do think like one of the problems with crypto Twitter having all of the attention is that, I mean, put yourself in the shoes of a, of a senator or a congressman. You get on Twitter and you see angry Twitter people, crypto people who are supposedly like, you know, executives at these big crypto companies coming after you. And I mean, that doesn't make you like them more. So my thought is if you can bring some of these people Absolutely. and sit them down with the, you know, Jeremy Allaire's of Circle and the Anatoly of Solana and Chris Dixon and Andreessen, like only good things will come of that, I think. And if we don't trust that good things will come from a congressman meeting with a, you know, with a, you know, founder of an L1 or of a Chris Dixon or something, like, uh, it's probably a bigger issue right there. But I, I do think those people are impressive enough and have a clear enough vision of the future and can articulate what crypto needs in the US that it's only beneficial to put those people together. Absolutely. You're a crypto nerd, but you're also a history nerd, right? Yeah. yeah. You told me you were reading three books about history at any point in time. What particular aspect of the American history fascinates you the most? Um... I think the best founders in history are probably the founding fathers, um, right? Whether it's, I mean, all, all of them in their own respective, right? Like I think the founding, I think the founding fathers are the best founders in history. I think that it's the, the two things that are the most interesting is how democracy has been able to thrive for so long, right? Uh, how the U.S. dollar has been able to thrive for so long and how capitalism isn't a perfect system, but seems to be the best system that we've got. Mm -hmm. And I just think when you read history, there's so many overlaps with um, with crypto, right? Specifically like booms and busts and people talk about bubbles and cycles. Like go if you go read history and I just got, I just finished reading, spending too much time reading about the, the Gilded Age and kind of the, the like 1840 to let's call it like 1910. And um, there's kind of the Civil War and through the Gilded Age of the 1870s and 80s through the like early 1900s when, you know, they started cr cracking down on a lot of the big monopolies and Standard Oil and things like that and uh, United Fruit and those kind of companies. The, the, Booms and busts and the cycles and the bubbles of those times make crypto bubbles look microscopic. Mm. And I just, I, I just love hearing these stories. I just, I think there's a lot of overlap. This is like more kind of a financial take, right? If you, if you think about the normal people who are maybe less into finance, why should everyone have some good general knowledge about the history of the country they live in? 
because I think it will give you pride in what's been built so far. Um, there's a lot of, I think, anti-American, like, you know, the, the American flag has been now associated with like, like Trump, I think, and like, kind of like the South and there's a, there's like a lot of like, I don't know, sitting with a friend watching the Olympics and he's like, yeah, you know, I'm rooting for Brazil. I'm not even rooting for the U S here. And, uh, <laughs> there's a, it's really easy to get caught up in the noise of what's happening today. And, you know, there's things I don't like, like cancel culture and this like woke politics and like all, all, all of that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm, I really think is detrimental, but if you zoom out and just like read and learn about the history of the U S it is the most, I think, impressive thing that's, I mean, you could say the Roman empire and the Brit British empire and all these empires, but like, it's the most impressive thing like org living organism, there's 350 million people here. Like the most impressive thing that's been built in the last couple hundred years is the United States mm. and just how it's been able to endure. So I think when you read about, whether you're reading about the railroads in the 1840s and 50s and 60s or, or just like enduring, I mean, we endured a crazy civil war or uh, the oil, like how, you know, the oil booms and busts in the 1870s or World War One or World War Two, or uh, just the, you know, the, the Revolutionary War. Like, I just think there's... um. We've, there's a resilience that the United States has had that is very tough to say any other country has had. And I think it gives you, when you learn about this stuff, it gives you a lot of pride in the U.S. What's something that you believe in that most people would not agree with? It's just the Peter Thiel question. Is this a, doesn't, I, I'm not sure if it's comes from there, but I, I like to ask it good, as one of the last questions because good, people are like, it's a good <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> Well, maybe there's a couple buckets. Like one one thing I believe with um, company building is that here are the here are the first two things that come to mind. I should have prepped for this question. I thought should have thought about this ahead of time. The two <laughs> things that come to mind are one is um, build for a niche audience as long as humanly possible, no matter what you're building, whether it's a podcast or a product or a SaaS product or a data, whatever, build for a niche product as long as humanly possible. I see people try to, I think there's a common belief that you go raise money and then you go try to get a ton of customers. I think that the longer you can build for a cult following and a core niche audience is, is valuable. The other thing that I really strongly believe that uh, I don't see other people doing, so maybe they disagree with me, I don't know, is... Um, the easiest way for a small company to look big is with world-class design. And I think that founders oftentimes think of designers as something that comes much later in a company. But, you know, I remember when we launched the BlockWorks website, people said, oh, you guys are like the Bloomberg of crypto. We had never published an article in our life. They said, oh, you guys are like the Bloomberg of crypto because <laughs> the website felt and looked, we copied Bloomberg. Mm. And I think if you're a, a two-person company, the fastest way to look like a 10-person company is with good design. If you're a 10-person company, the easiest way to look like a 100-person company is with a beautiful front end and a beautiful website. And um, I think people, in, especially in crypto, think that design is overrated, but I would really strongly push back on that. First impression matters. Yeah. It's the only, it's the only thing that matters. Nobody reads copy on a website. Nobody reads your marketing materials. They just look at how nice is the design. No one has Do any they look span. legitimate or 100%. not? Yeah. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? Um, I think we are going to go into a bull market that people can't really wrap their heads around. Um, <laughs> The, if you, there's all this, you know, it's funny, like, you know, prices were going down the other day, a month ago or something, or a couple of weeks ago, and everyone's panicking. If you just zoom out, like, okay, so just zoom out and think about this for a second. Bitcoin hit an all-time high with interest rates being yanked higher to 5%. Hmm. What starts happening when we are just starting to enter a dollar bear market? So we're, we're entering a dollar bear market. So the dollar's turning over and interest rates are getting pulled down and we're going into election season. I just think that people are ex really severely caught up in the, it's end of August, you know, it's summertime, the market's going to consolidate for mm. a little while. I don't, I don't think people understand how violent to the upside a bull market can get um, until they really see it. And you've got 
the like the my belief in crypto and my like conviction in this industry in the asset class like as of today is never has I've ne- has really never been stronger for so many elements like the ETFs are extremely underrated um like the you know if you if you're a venture firm like I think if I think you could call vent crypto the last investable vertical right now like consumer there hasn't been a consumer hit in 10 years maybe TikTok but that's it fintech we've maxed out what we can build on ACH rails AI extremely centralizing force maybe there's anthropic and perplexity and chat GBT that make it but it's it's all all that power will go to Google and Amazon and Facebook mm. and stuff um there's uh, American dynamism, right? Like Anderol and like these like kind of hard tech companies, defense companies. You need maybe one in a hundred venture firms can invest in those because they're so capital intensive. And we don't even know what the valuations of those will look like. Uh, I think that like what will become really obvious in 2025 is that every venture firm in the world will will will, will need, again, some sort of crypto strategy. Uh, and every institution will be able to finally get off zero and make some allocations, whether that's to the Bitcoin ETF, the ETH ETF, whether they start playing on chain. I mean, BlackRock's got half a billion dollars on chain right now. Um, so I think my biggest conviction is that we're going into a pretty colossal bull market and people seem to be really under underestimating that right now. Love it. Asked the same question to Meltem this morning and she just answers it up only. <laughs> That's, I, <laughs> then mean, I said. Then I said, much can, more eloquent than I could, Melton. Yeah. <laughs> then I said, can you please explain? She was like, no, no, I, I don't. And now I have the explanation. There's my explanation. So, yeah. Thank you so much for doing that, man. That was an amazing conversation. Thank you. It was great. I really oh. enjoyed it. Awesome.